I feel like you've. Oh, yeah, yeah definitely. Excellent. excellent. I'm so pressing live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Kavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Kavanagh. Here at Kavanagh's HR, we're getting ready to launch our crowdfunding campaign, and right now we're gauging interest. Find out more at https refunder.com slash Kavanagh's HR. Our guest today is Amy Swanson. Amy, are you ready to be great today? Yes. So Amy, softball question first. What do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? I have a six-year-old. All of her friends come over to my home and there's like four of them and they asked me to take them places to get ice cream. The other weekend we went onto a boat. There was a research vessel that was parked outside of UW. Um, and so we all went and toured the Rachel Carson and that was really cool. Um, I basically, I hang out with a lot of like six to eight-year-olds for fun. <laughs> so you're, you're the house like all the kids go to that one. I know every, growing up, you, you, there's one house that neighbor everyone goes to. That's your I, right now, it seems to be. I live in UW Family Housing, which is really, really great. So everybody in the housing is a student with kids. Um, and so the kids kind of run from one home to the next home. And it's really great to have this community of children. It doesn't really exist in most places in Seattle. So I feel very lucky to have found a community with full of children and, and awesome people. So what kind of things are your kid interested in right now? Uh, she makes TikTok videos. I'm not a very strict parent. Um, I'm like kind of into whatever she does. And I just think um, interest in anything is so special. Um, and so I don't really stop her from being on the social media platforms. Her and her friends will make little videos, but she's interested in everything. And so it's like, she'll go outside and run around in a circle for hours and hours. And I feel like right now, all of her interests are very healthy. She's not like a zombie playing VR for hours on end. And so I feel like she's balanced and I'm happy that she's balanced. She goes to gymnastics, she engages in activities. And so I'm, I'm just happy that she lets me into her little world. <laughs> so you ever get any criticism from other parents? Like, oh, you shouldn't have on TikTok. She's too young or any that kind of stuff. It's hot debate. <laughs> but, uh, but it's, see what she posts and I like monitor her. And so if it's too, and I'll dislike things so she doesn't get too much um, weird content. And so I do, I am aware of what she's out there and what she's posting out there, but I do like her content. It does feel random. Sometimes she'll get like 2000 views and she's so consistent with it. Just like constantly putting out content that like just, um, I think the practice of it is really interesting. This is the same thing, but I remember back in the day, like when being kids, parents were like, Get off the video game, go play outside. But now people playing video games making millions of dollars a year. Making so you're thinking like how many of those kids, the parents like this, let them play video games more, they'll like hone their craft and like making millions of dollars a day, you it's know. It's true. I think maybe she wants to be a comedy person. And maybe it's like if I can just push her more into comedy classes or more English classes. And it's like if she's decided this as her interest as an early age. My husband also does videos. Um, we met, like do, he would take me to his like movies and stuff like that. And so he's also pushing her. He makes a lot of stop motion. And so I think she's getting pushed in this direction. The the engineer in me would be like, oh, do more science. But <laughs> I think she's she's headed this direction. I will whatever she's interested in I just I love it <laughs> talk about being a student at UW right now you're getting an MBA right now right yes talk about I that UW is an excellent community. I recommend for all entrepreneurs to engage with your university. It doesn't even have to be at the student level. I would say I started engaging with um, the university as a company. Um, and so I needed more experience in ultrasound. Um, I got my degree in electrical engineering and I was like, I need to know way more about ultrasound if I'm building an ultrasonic washer and dryer. And so I contacted the applied physics lab where they have the center for industrial and medical ultrasound. Um, the director of that center, Dr. Tom Matula was so great gracious. He loves working with industry and I couldn't have found a better person to connect with. He has been a wonderful mentor. Um, uh, when we approached him, he was like, oh, do you want on this project? And so we joined on a project at the Applied Physics Lab that's been going really, really well. It's very interesting to see stuff inside the university versus outside of the university. So I started at the Applied Physics Lab doing research. I got deeper into the university by doing um, more like uh, student like pitch competitions. Um, my co-founder is getting his master's in electrical engineering. Um, and so because he was a student, we were able to do a lot of student pitch competitions. Our company is in the uh, University of Washington co-motion incubator. So they have a hardware space for companies. And after being so immersed in the university, I decided to get my MBA there. And then networking is everything. Having a cohort with connections at Boeing and Airbus, um, Amazon and Microsoft really 
allows me to leverage other people's experiences and helps me find contracts in places maybe where I wouldn't have had a foot in the door. You talk about the startup space in Washington, University of Washington, because I, I think it's been a bit, but one of the better ones. Of course, Stanford's known to have a, a good one. Well, UW has to have one of, the, one of the better startup ecosystems in the United States, I would think, right? Yes, it's very, very healthy. I've benefited it from it greatly. Um, the University of Washington has at least four student business plan competitions that I've participated in. Um, it's been great. And just, oh, I guess five, I've participated in five University of Washington um, student business plan competitions and just having that experience and having their group of mentors come to you and really, really refine your pitching, really, really refine your business model and then support your business every step of the way. Um, it's hard to find those networks and those doors to open outside of the university, which is a lot of the reason why I came from outside of the university and immersed myself into the university. And I think it's a resource that's available to multiple people. You can engage with the university in so many ways. They have the Burke Entrepreneurship Center. There is Comotion, which is like prolific and they amount of IP that they generate. They have their innovation core program. So there's a million different programs that you can connect with in small ways just to learn more about entrepreneurship. And Commotion Labs, they also host tech stars, right? Commotion, inside of Startup Hall, which is kind of the software heavy part, portion of, um, so Commotion is an entity. They do all of the IP inside of the University of Washington, um, as well as host all of these resources for entrepreneurship. Um, they really are interested in bridging the gap between research and commercialization. So they have like a whole bunch of lawyers. They have a whole bunch of programs as well as these incubators. Inside one of the incubators is uh, Techstars. And so that's inside of Startup Hall, which is really just like a jewel of like Seattle startup community. Inside of there, they also have a BCU FinTech Accelerator and a bunch of different uh, programs that they host. Is this such a thing as like pitching too much and networking too much if you're an entrepreneur? I think I'm at this phase where I'm kind of on the down low right now. Um, I think I was very, very before we did a couple best tests. We were excited about the tech and then we went and really, really refined the market. And now we're super, super confident in the market and we need to, fi to finish developing the tech. Um, and so we're at this space where we need to lay low a little bit. Um, I have had friends in the hardware space where they start talking about their hardware. They'll post about it online. And then there are people out there watching who are ready to steal your IP. There are patent trolls around, there are bots on the internet constantly scrolling. If China sees something good, they'll knock you off immediately. Um, I had a friend who made a really cool technology and she's been seeing it advertised online and her technology isn't even done yet. She's still developing it and they're trying to sell it. And she's like, I know this can't exist because I'm still working on this technology. Like I am at the forefront of this. And so there are, you do have to be careful, but I would say it is in your benefit to network as much as possible. Just be careful with what you say and who you say it to. Talk about patents, because you, 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 you're you getting a patent yourself, right? Mm -hmm. so yes. Think about, talk about that process a little bit. Patents is a whole thing. It's nice to be within the University of Washington because, um, if you work with them, and I think the University of Washington is in a good place where now where they do have, they've benefited and generated a lot of um, income from their patents. I think there was a place where, um, when I was the director of the Center for Industrial Medical Ultrasound was, they weren't defending as many of their his patents, but now I think they're in a place where they have generated a lot of revenue from people selling their startups and companies. So they have the money to defend patents and invest more in patenting. Um, and so if you are one of their companies, if your IP comes from them um, and they have a bunch of lawyers, they'll you can kind of go through the different stages. They'll pay for it. If they see potential in it, they will fund it most of the way. On the other side, my company, Ultropia, is not associated to the university and we don't want to pay royalties on it. So we're very, very careful that all of these resources that we're getting from the university, we're not doing any technical development with. And so we draw this line with our funding to make sure that we're not doing technical development with certain pools of funding that we get. Otherwise, the university could claim ownership of RP. Um, and so we're very, very careful with that. Um, in terms of patents, uh, there's very many stages of patents. Um, and so just starting with your utility patent, um, it, that, getting that process correct, uh, you can do it. There's different resources. I, I would say this is when I would say um, there are lawyers who will help you write it. It costs maybe $3,000 or some of the quotes that I've heard. Um, and then maybe higher than that, if you want them to write it all. 
Um, and I would recommend even just having them help you write it can be really beneficial. And then it can, utility patents can probably maybe around $7,000 I would budget for that. And then the next stage, I would say turning it into the provisional, that's where it gets a little bit more expensive. I've heard people spending maybe like $35,000 on their patent. Um, and then we would like an international patent so we can work with some of these international um, manufacturers. Um, and so it gets expensive from there. You have just like a, a few months after you, so you have about a year on your provisional, about a year on your utility before you need to file your international patent. You can get an extension, a PCT, which lasts about 18 months. And then after that, um, you would need to get patents in every single country that you wanted a patent in. Um, I think it is beneficial at this time to get a patent in China. It's kind of been back and forth, but China's defense system is getting a lot better. And so I think you are able to defend it in China. At the same time, I love things like Prusa who keep their IP completely open source. Um, and they have gone out of the way to, like they don't patent anything and they just innovate and they just innovate and people come to them and they're like, hey, we are knocking you off. We're manufacturing this. You need to stop doing this. We, we have the patent, but they have managed to not get any patents. Um, they just simply reply and they're like, you can't patent this. This is like old technology. Like we're in the right, we have a right to produce this and they keep innovating and they keep producing and all of their stuff is out there available to anyone. So I love that as well. They are based in Europe. I, maybe it's easier in Europe. In America, it does seem like we do, we patent everything. So what does patent actually do for you? For example, suppose you got a patent for what you're doing mm -hmm. and you find out three years later, someone's doing the exact same thing. Like you like, does the patent make them stop? Like what, what teeth does that patent actually have? Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, it just kind of defends your stake in the ground. It gives you a right to produce and someone can't block you out of the market and, and send you a cease and desist letter. And so I would say the main reason for a small company getting getting a patent is just to say like, hey, I was here first. I, can, I am allowed to make this. If a larger company comes along, you might not have the resources to defend it. I've heard of companies before who, who get the patents. They do everything right. A large company will send them a cease and desist letter and they spend all of their resources defending it and then eventually go out of business. And so it's something you have to be very, very strategic about. Just because you have a patent, it doesn't necessarily mean that you uh, are able to defend it at all times. Um, investors do like to see a patent. It gives them confidence in the technology. So if you are going the route of raising a lot of investor dollars, um, that would be very beneficial because they are they have something to stand behind. Um, and then our strategy has been to um, work with uh, a larger company who would possibly be able to uh, patent some of the IP and defend some of that IP. Is your background engineering or physics or both? Electrical engineering specifically. Okay. Um, ultrasound is a multidisciplinary field. It has a lot of physics. It has a lot of mechanics. Um, uh, there is a lot of signal processing that happens. Um, ultrasound is the same thing like when someone gets pregnant, you go to ultrasound. Sounds it's, and, it, and you can think of it like a speaker as well, like the way that sound works, because we're using acoustic energy. Um, with the pregnancy, um, they they use the ultrasound to image the baby. Um, ours is more uh, power ultrasonics. Um, and so we are applying that acoustic force as well as creating vacuums in the water, as well as coupling with the clothes to dry the clothing. So y'all done a great job. It's like, it's not like y'all find almost, I'm exaggerating, it's not like y'all find a new grant every weekday, right? And you'll apply for anyone, right? How do you... You find all this energy and uh, like bandwidth to take the extra pocket. I know it's not a matter of you just fill application. It's like mm -hmm. work can be done for each application, right? Can you talk about that? It was a very intensive period. I would say our first year of applying to a lot of these grants. We've gone into this phase now where I've selected three, and we will go over those particular grants, the things that I feel like we're a best fit for. Initially, it was a shotgun approach. Anything and everything I applied to because we were a young startup and we needed to fund ourselves. We needed to get our name out there, and so that took me and and my co-founders pretty much all of our time just to do that. And so it was like, we did the initial best tense, the technology looked good. We went very, very deep into just doing all of these pitch competitions. And that took a significant amount of time. I'd say we did that for about a year and now we're going into this technical development phase. And so that'll be um, a year or more. When did you learn that you wanted, or when did you like come to your mind, like, you know, I want to be an engineer? 
Oh, I think that took a long process. Um, I have an atraditional career path. I started as a massage therapist um, and I did a bunch of, um, I think I've always been entrepreneurial. Um, and so I think since I got my massage license, I would work for myself. I would also like clean houses and do some bartending or watch people's kids. And so I would string together these jobs where people ask me to do stuff. They're like, hey, Amy, can you come by and clean my blinds? And I'd be like, yeah, I can come by and clean your blinds. And so I was able to make most of my my money, especially as a young adult. That's how I did it. Um, my dad always wanted me to go back to school and get a degree. Um, he had some money for me after my mom passed away. He was like, you should get a bachelor's degree. I feel like this would help you. And so I looked into different things. I took a bunch of classes. It's not something I would have done right out of high school, but the more classes that I took, um, it was really excellent information. I wanted to make more money than I did at massage. Um, it was something that I couldn't teach myself easily. Um, and it was the things that you could build were amazing. I always wanted to have this impact on the world and being able to do it with your hands and create something is very satisfying as an engineer. So have, have you ever had to get to the point where you're like, man, the business ain't doing well, funds going low. Let me go do some massages on the side. So I guess I'll bring some money in. <laughs> I could always do that. And that's a lot of the reason I got the massage degree um, is just in case I need some extra cash. I can always, I can always go do massages. Um, the applied physics lab pays me um, right now. So I feel like that's been my extra source of income. Um, so I, the project there is going really, really well. And then it's been great that it's flexible. Sometimes I don't go in because I'm very busy. I can work up to 20 hours a week there if I need to. Um, and it, just depending on how the project goes too. And so uh, I also apply for grants for that project. Um, and as that project goes along, I can put more or less hours in, but it's going very, very well. <laughs> So next, talk about y'all won something called an MIT's Climate and Energy Prize. Yes. Um, MIT has a business plan competition that's focused on climate and energy innovations. Um, this was uh, while we were doing a bunch of um, MIT was one that we applied for. We never thought that we would win this one. Um, usually people from MIT win this prize. I think I looked previously, I was like, oh, uh, an Oklahoma team got pretty far. So maybe we can get third place or something. Um, and they have a really excellent process. I would recommend if you have a climate technology, go ahead and apply for this simply because the network and as well as the process that they walk you through, um, it's one of the better ones. I feel like a ship, a lot of these programs can be really, really helpful because they'll walk you through your value proposition, customer discovery, developing your pitch deck. And MIT was really, really good about putting everyone on an equal playing field, which I loved. Um, and so they went through that process and then they had several stages in their business plan competition, as well as a conference that was great. I attended the conference. It was wonderful to network at that conference. Um, and then they had several stages of pitching and we slowly advanced through every stage. We were very surprised and delighted at every stage because you see different and different labs and labs that you heard of and you're like, oh, that lab is so cool and they're developing their this technology and like they should definitely win. And it's so amazing to be surrounded by so many people with so many wonderful ideas. Um, and so we were delighted when we had gotten so far and been so successful. And I think it was a testament to how much we had been refining our pitch. We had done MIT at the end of the season. So we had done um, a lot of pitch competitions before and we had gotten very, very good. And so I think it was more a testament to us practicing a lot. So Amy, your entrepreneur full-time full -time job, your mother full-time job, <laughs> wife full-time job. Why in the world you get an MBA? <sighs> The, I, I'm doing it part-time and I'm doing it in the evening. And then just having access to some of these brains at the University of Washington is amazing. I feel like I could pay a consultant um, just hundreds of dollars an hour. And I instead I could just go talk to my professor and be like, so I have this marketing strategy and I'm thinking about doing like this. And like her time is like, I'm paying tuition. She wants to see me benefit. She has connections and resources for me. And so in access, like the access to the professors, the accesses to the re universe, re university resources, um, the programs that I'm able to participate in, as well as my cohort, everyone who is my peer is in all these wonderful positions and is able to help me and is excited about my career trajectory and wants to see me work with some of their companies. And so it's very, very great. So talk about your experience at South by Southwest this year. I think you co found on both of them, right? Yes. Talk about how that was a positive for you. Uh, South by Southwest was really um, fun. We went, um, we were banking with SVB. And so we went when SVB was 
I, I, I guess when they died, uh, they have become first citizens now. And so it, the, the transition has been really smooth. We stayed with them. I didn't really take it seriously. I was like, oh, everybody is hysteria. You never pull your money out. Like, it'll be fine. And we didn't have enough to be really worried about. I feel like we have like less than like the FDIC insures everything we have in there. So we weren't very worried about it. Um, our cards didn't work during that time. So we were like, mm. This is the best time for that. But South by Southwest was, um, I would say, was like this brand experience. And so it was a really like a study in how you can create these really immersive brands that people want to engage with. So just going out there and looking how Porsche or Dolby are creating these really immersive experiences that people love engaging with. It gives you ideas about our own brand. And it's like, what do we want to put out in there into the world that people want to engage with and be excited about? So we're talking about network on a little bit, but like, like, especially Seattle, you go to network event every day of the week, pretty much, right? How do you personally decide which ones are like you want to go to to get, to get the most value out of them and give value at the same time? In the beginning, I would go to a lot of them. And then I think I... Um, have connected with a lot of the people that I feel like I connected, needed to connect with. And so now I go to the ones that I'm most excited about or the ones that I feel like I don't know. Um, we did go to, um, Prusa was having an event with Meet the Founders and that was really, really excellent. I feel like my co-founder is a very, very lucky person. The tickets have been sold out to this event for months. And right when he clicked on the link, someone must have returned two tickets because he was able to scoop up two tickets. And we went to this event last minute and just talking to the founders about their process of, creating this 3D printer and then turning it into this community was like really inspiring for us as well as their, their ability to keep it open source. And like, this is amazing. I'd love to follow this trajectory. Um, and there's other networking events um, that I'll go to with friends that I want to connect with. I think there's one about just, um, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to use Carta. I feel like just cap table management in general. Um, and so things that I feel like I, oh, I want a little bit more information on this or a little bit more information on this before when I didn't know anything, I'd go to all of them. And now it's like, oh, I need, I, I just really need to know what buttons to click in Carta. I'm going to go to this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about this. And this is my opinion, right? Like, like if a guy's an entrepreneur, he's a father, they never talk about him being a dad or, you know, taking care of kids. It's always your entrepreneur. But it's like female entrepreneurs, they always talk about, ask, ask female entrepreneurs, but how do you balance being a mother and a wife and a kid, right? Do you find that annoying or? I think we should ask men the same question because I think it's so important that men set an example. Um, it's shown that if you give men paternity leave, um, they get the same connections that they do. All of these wonderful hormones, all the oxytocin that you get from spending time with the baby baby only get it by being physically close to their child. And then the more paternity leave that you give to men, um, the more equal women end up in society. And so men really need to go out there and be talking about their kids and what it's like to do that. Every, everyone sh is sharing in the experience. Women have a lot of hormones around it. So we love talking about it, but men can get that too. And the more that we give them those opportunities in society, the more that we ask men, Hey, how is it going men are likely to change diapers wash dishes and really feel like they are comfortable in the domestic space so i feel like we really need to create place is for men in the domestic space to really step into that role and to thrive next talk about your co-founder like talk about how you, how you co-founder met your co-founder relationship you know a lot i think one of the top reasons startups fail is because co-founders like pretty much separate separate ways that you get, you get managed over so how else have you all been like so successful so far you, the co-founder relationship is, I would recommend starting a, a business with someone. Um, I think it's hard, um, but I think we've been so successful because of our differences. Um, having that brain outside of your brain. Um, I've, I've been reading um, Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, and he was able to develop a lot of his theory simply by having a conversation with his friend Amos. And Amos should have gotten, um, I think, the Nobel Prize that he won as well. Um, and just him going out every day and talking with his friend, they were able to generate so many of these ideas. And having that person that is outside of your brain, that you're able to have these conversations with, and there are periods of high conflict, um, but managing that conflict is so important. A lot of people People are afraid of conflict and want to step away from conflict, but conflict can be healthy if you engage with it in a positive way. There's a lot of emotional draining, negative conflict that will cause you to separate with your co-founder and make sure you have your co-founder agreements in place because they will come up and you'll have to figure out when to split the company. But we are both equally passionate about this. Um, and because of our passion, even though there are differences, it makes us stronger and it makes us sharper. 
how do y'all communicate? How do y'all communicate? Like, yo, know, like meet every day, the Slack, email, text, like how do y'all communicate? We work together very, very closely in person every single day. We go to different labs. We're on the same project at the Applied Physics Lab. Um, and it can be a lot to be inside of each other's heads all of the time. Um, and I, But I think because of that, we're able to generate these really amazing ideas. We could have some, I think the redundancy, even in us working both on the same projects, we bring such different perspectives to it. I would say I'm a more emotional thinker. He's more of a logical thinker. Um, and the difference between us, we balance really, really well together. And then it's perceived by a wider audience really, really well. People like our dynamic. They like the high energy that I bring to things. But also when they see him more thoughtful and more grounded, they feel like it's more possible. So in the future, like suppose, you don't have any people working for you now, right, right now, right? We have people that we, um, uh, so we contract some people. We have some people who pick up small projects for us. Um, uh, as we can afford different people, we hire them to do different tasks. So let's say in the future, you have like, we'll say you have 35 people working for you, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to work with the dynamics so on like, you know, telling them what to do, like, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that it's not the mom versus dad that I go. Yes. How do you make sure that it's not going to happen? And a lot of that's the reason that I'm getting my MBA is because I think it's very, very important. I want to take this classical approach to things um, and do this bottoms up approach. We really, really like the agile scrum method. And so I'm very much about empowering um, the people around me. And so not being an authoritative, I said, you need to do this. And then my co-founder is the same way. We we don't want to create this environment where we're in charge. We want to create this environment where we listen to the people. And it's like, we have chosen to work with you because you have brilliant ideas and you're going to be the expert on this subject. And whatever you tell me as the expert, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to provide you with the resources to get that done. And so in terms of like, a, like, Managerial accounting is an excellent class if you want to know more about different leadership and management styles, especially in a financial sense. I probably not the number that. one class thing. <laughs> probably no, no one's number one class on our, you know, on our roster, right? Put it up there. It's it's a core class, and I feel like when you think of accounting, you think of taxes, but there's so many different types of accounting. Managerial accounting, I would say, will give you the um, quantitative approach to why you should make decisions, and so understanding, like from a business resources perspective, why you're making your decisions and how you're empowering your employees. Like managerial accounting is the class that you should take for that. <laughs> so y'all been through a few accelerators. Can you talk about some of the positives and negatives of being through these accelerators? Mm -hmm. Accelerators can be all over the place. Um, I did participate in an accelerator recently um, that drained me very emotionally. Um, and I think some of that was I was doing too many things. I had just started my MBA program. Um, I was doing, I needed to do a hundred interviews in the this a span of six weeks. Um, and at the same time, I had people telling me that I wasn't a good CEO. I needed to replace myself and I wasn't sleeping. I was sleeping just a couple hours of every night and I wasn't um, I got all of my milestones done. I did everything very, very well. Um, but I think I was so tired and I was so burnt out and I, I won't do that to myself anymore. Now the things that I am participating in, I can be my full self. I can be engaged. And then when I go there, I get more out of the experience. And so being very, very careful with your energies and how you're spending your time is important. They were all good experiences, but now I can, I'm more selective. Like I want to participate in one at the time and then put my whole self in to them so how do you take care of yourself like how do you make sure like you're you're good like both physically and mentally and all, all the above mm -hmm. i i would say it's hard i would say i struggled with that this fall um i'm doing better now um and i've chosen to do less i feel like my program just ended and so i feel like i got a lot more time back and i can focus on the projects that i'm doing i do love everything that i'm doing um and so it's hard for me to not want to engage in something i feel like i've recently taken on a plastic recycling program because all of the equipment was lying around and i got support from the university and it's just because my co-founder was collecting a lot of trash and he's like, I'm going to recycle this. I'm going to recycle this. And I'm like, well, there's all this equipment here. Let's recycle this. And so it's not something I plan on doing forever, but there's enough students at the university who are interested in this. And so I do love doing these things, but I need to be very, very careful not to give all of myself to. Do you have like a red flag for your company? For example, if you don't get this much revenue by this time or don't meet this metric by this date, or are you just going to keep on going until you're like, make it happen? I know people who do have flags where they stop. And I think that's really, really healthy. 
um, because I proved out the market and I spent so much time proving out the market and I got so much traction, I don't think I would call it quits on Ultropia. Um, other projects that I'm doing, um, maybe if the Applied Physics Lab project didn't go well, I would I would stop on those ones. But because Ultropia's market has been so strong and everybody has been so supportive, um, even if things aren't going well, and I've been selective with how we rate do funding, so far it's been mostly non-dilutive. Um, so I've been very, very careful about how it grows, I've been more picky than normal. Um, I care about where our money is coming from. I care how we're developing the product. I don't want to put a product with a lot of lead into the environment. Um, and so there's all these decisions that I'm making that are a little bit slower, that will take a little bit longer, that um, maybe keeps us bootstrapping for a longer period of time, but I'm okay with that because there's a very particular vision about how people interact with laundry at the end that I want to see fulfilled. So a couple of weeks ago, me and, and Amy were on this panel from the LSU students. I'm going to ask her another question, ask her the panel, right? And so both both of streams, I mean, it's like generalities, right? On one hand, you have people that tell you, you know, within 90 days, you don't have product market fit MVP and like a million dollars of revenue, stop. Other end, you have people like, I don't care what it is. You have, even you've been there for 10 years, no product, no nothing. Keep going, don't quit. Mm -hmm. I has to be more than middle. What you take on those two extremes? Those are both very extreme. I am someone who follows my happiness and that's kind of what I gauge to do things by. And it's not like this instant gratification. It's this long-term happiness that I'm building over time. And if I, if I'm happy doing it, I do it by how I'm feeling. And so I listen to myself. I'm pretty aware of my body and how I'm feeling. My co-founder isn't. My co-founder is, is not aware of body. And I think he's not able to do that. He doesn't know when he needs to eat. I need to let's stop, let's take a break, let's eat and circle back. And so I do it based on how I am feeling um, in terms of like aggressively growing. I don't think that's healthy. I think they're showing that companies that do it more intentionally, they last a lot longer. I'm not really in it for the quick gains, but if you are, if like some people make a lot of money on the stock market really quickly. And if you're just in it for the money and you want to make a profit real, real quick, then maybe do it as fast fast as possible, rich, that's totally acceptable. Like, to, like try, fail, try and fail. So there is that iteration cycle where if you can fail as fast as possible, you should, and you shouldn't be trying to have any blind corners or soft spots. So you should be aware of all your blind spots. And so I think that's where that advice comes from. It's not terrible advice at all. Um, so be aware of these places that you feel like are too soft for people to poke. Let people look at them. They don't have to be mean people. Let them kind of look and help you refine and be careful with the people that you're taking advice from. Um, and let them look at your, your ideas and share your ideas and try to get the market. And once you get that nailed down, I would say if there's lots of traction and you're excited about it and this is what you're doing, like go for it. But if you're putting all this energy into it and it's been a long time and maybe there's other things that seem more exciting with you, you can do things slowly. You can do things on the side. It can be something you do a little bit here and there until you get more traction on and it, it goes back up again. So never, nothing has to be so black and white. Nothing has to be so start, stop. But if you want to put something down for a while, that's, that's healthy. That's okay too. So- Besides your own tech, what's some tech outside out there that's exciting you right now? Yeah. Tech out there right now. I feel like being a part of these startup competitions and seeing everybody else's companies, like it's people are working on amazing technology. Um, one of the things that I am excited about is um, I did the Venture Well um, Accelerator program recently, and um, there was a company out of Penn State. Um, they're developing a technology um, that uh, replaces a lot of the PFAS in things. Um, I think PFAS, it's in all of your non-stick pans. Um, it's a pretty much everything that says compostable is has PFAS in it and is maybe not necessarily compostable. Um, Parisa, the woman who founded the startup, or I guess is a researcher on the startup, she did a lot of the tests with um, a lot of these materials. And then when she got it back, she realized, hey, like pretty much everything has PFAS, but nobody advertises that. And they wouldn't really stop producing this. And so she has all this information about these all compostable, eco-friendly products, and none of them are compostable. None of them are eco-friendly. Um, but she has developed this, this system where you just swap out, um, it's a starch, you can swap out all of these sprays that they put on this paper. And so she can sell it to paper companies. And it's, it's just a bucket of chemicals. Instead of using the PFAS chemicals, they can use her uh, eco-friendly chemicals and just switch it out and spray starch onto all of the 
on the food wrappers, all of your fast food, your takeout boxes, your pizza, your forks, everything that has PFAS can be replaced with this technology that she's developed. That would mean like you go to pitch competition and someone's pitching, like thinking yourself, how in the world do you not have $25 million already? Like, and they raise like, and they, and they say, we've got no other time. Like how, how is this possible? I, like you change the world with this idea yes. and, and you have attraction instead of how, they, but they can't raise funds. It's, it's always like amazes me. Yes. And I think some of that is um, like, there, there's different reasons in every case. Um, some of it's just dependent on people's networks. It's hard to get access into these networks. Um, some of, and a lot of that is based on if you are, if you are a over six foot tall white man yeah. who went to an Ivy league university. And it kills me. <laughs> people say go family, do a family friend around. Most people don't have family and friends no. like that, right? Like, no, like, they do not like, have like, family and friends I'm, like I'm that. The, like, most people say, I'm the family and friends, <laughs> right? Family. <laughs> you know? It's, and it, and I feel like that's since I've stepped into the university, like going from, I feel like my upbringing was just kind of all over the place. And then stepping into the university, I feel like talking to these people now, they're like, hey, do you need, like, do you need money for your early round? And it's just like, wow, like I, all of a sudden I stepped into this network, like, like, I found the family and friends around. Is that easy? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's finding doors to these places. It was like, it took, electrical engineering wasn't my, I would say natural path. And so I feel like, like I went through that process and people like to see like a woman in tech and then like going and getting my MBA. And so it took a long time for me to have access to these networks. But now that I have them, it's like, wow, this is, this is how people do it. So if you want to climb a mountain, go, go for it and find these people. <laughs> who, who are your mentors right now? Mm -hmm. um, definitely the center for the industrial and, and medical ultrasound. So Dr. Tom Atula has been really, really excellent. Um, all of my professors have been really wonderful. I gleaned different things from them. Um, my embedder, embedded systems professor, Dr. Jabulani Niati, has been really, really excellent. Anytime I need anything, he got me through electrical engineering. I would have not been able to get through electrical engineering without him. Um, and now anytime I need anything, like he's there, I'm like, I need a mentor for this program. And it's going to be during the daytime while you're at work. And I need you to show up for four hours, which is a really large ask, but I need someone to be there. And he's, he's there whenever I need someone present to participate in something he has been really helping us and reach all of these steps that we need to to reach and more important question who are you mentoring right now oh it's been my goal in my mba program to mentor i think at least um like 30 students and i think i have achieved i think I've, it's been going really really well um sleeve ai they had done really really well they did the dub hacks accelerator and i've been like watch their progress grow from the first pitch deck to the last pitch deck. And I was really, really proud of that process. Um, I'll go and I'll talk to different classes and anybody that I'm in an accelerator program with um, and anybody out there, like reach out to me. I'm very, very open to that. Um, if you want to see what my strategy has been for pitch plan competitions, I will send you my strategy. I will send you the list of resources that I've applied to. Um, so I don't want to keep this information hidden. I don't want people to feel like, oh, you've done this and I I couldn't possibly do this. Like it, it took me a while to figure it out, but now that I have that knowledge, I want to share that knowledge. And so I'm very, very open to anyone that wants information or access to resources. I don't think they should be in this box hidden away from everyone. I think they're accessible and people just don't know the right questions to ask to get there. So since I've known you, you've always been comfortable speaking in front of people. I'm very, very polished public speaker. Have you always been like that? Something that's a skill you had to learn or? I have been in theater for a long time. And so I think I was raised- So that helps a little bit, yeah, right? <laughs> so Just a little bit. It was the theater. I think that's a lot of it. And I think it depends on my, um, like I'm very, very comfortable in this setting. I recently did a TED Talk class um, at the university. And I think I was a lot more awkward on that because it was a lot more vulnerable. Um, and so just speaking really vulnerably is difficult. Um, and, and I feel like I would pause more and the information was great and people loved the talks, but I would talk too fast and I would get too excited. And so it wasn't the most refined process. And I think it's because I was talking about things that were so personal to me. This is, this is what I do every day. This is where I'm at. I could talk to you for hours just about this. <laughs> That's my problem too. I always like to talk too fast. Like, you know, I'm saying the sentence, my brain is already, or is already a sentence number six, right? So I'm trying to catch it. I always got to like make sure I like focus on talking slow. So what is atomization? Atomization is the process of um, when the ultrasound couples to wet fabric, um, instead of like, it's kind of like the vapor that forms instead of um, like on a dryer, it, a lot of heat gets, it gets pumped into it and it vaporizes off. Instead, um, the water separates from the clothes um, and it's a cold process instead of a hot process and it removes the water that way. 
And so you're, you're, you're trying to replace a washer and dryer, two separate machines with a two-in-one, right? Mm -hmm. I would really like to reinvent the way people interact with clothes. We'll start in the industrial space, um, and then we'd like to move into the res residential space eventually. Um, that would um, be a different process. I imagine the system of... Um, uh, automation that go that we sell we sell to you and it gets put into your closet that's very easy um and then when you're at, done at the end of the day you take your clothes and it runs it through the washer and dryer and it hangs it up and so there's this thing that I would like to develop it's very far off but in in the future I don't want it to just be like oh I take this this pile of clothes I throw it in my washer I throw it in the dryer I, I've cleaned a lot of houses I have people have paid me money to fold their laundry it's a struggle I feel like everywhere we go laundry is a struggle and it's just, I want to, I want to change. I want to change that for people. <laughs> so the, your machine, it would be the same size as the laundry and wash it together. It's actually like just half the size. How does the sizing work? I think it would be totally different. I think if you're thinking of it, it doesn't have a drum in it. And I think that's the biggest difference. And so if you're thinking of like a traditional washer and dryer with a drum that spins things around, um, it could look like anything. It's based on the ultrasound array that's inside of it. Um, so it could be like a drawer. It, it could be more of just like a, a thin little thing that, and it could do just like maybe it would do probably do one, just a couple pieces of clothing at a time. And it would do really, really fast and then just hang it up. Is there any safety concerns with doing ultrasound like this? Um, I think, and I think we will be in a very high frequency above human hearing range. And I think we will be able to contain everything into the system. Um, right now, ultrasound cleaning is very, very popular, um, but there's no regulations around it. Maybe there should be. Um, it does create a pressure field in the air. And if you're very sensitive, if your ears are very sensitive, especially with these lower frequency ultrasound cleaners, um, they can cause a lot of pressure in your head and possibly cause migraines. Um, we would like to keep it out of animal hearing range, out of cat hearing range, and then How contain, about with dogs? Yeah, out of dog hearing range, and then contain a lot of those vibrations within the unit. And so just have good dampening systems. What does this mean? At Autropia, we want to dem dem democratize the wash and dryer for the world. Five billion people in the world wash their clothes by hand in That's 2010. Insane. I read that. I asked myself, that there's nowhere that can be true. Right? Yes. That's there's, insane. There's, if, there's a really excellent TED Talk by Hans Rosling about the magic washing machine and kind of the process that like his grandma getting a washer and dryer really freed up time and was able to take him to the library. And it made a difference in so many people's lives not to go from washing clothes by hand. But at the same time, it's really good for the environment to wash clothes by hand. And people who do wash clothes by hand, they really, really enjoy it. But now we have so many outfits that we need to keep track of. And I want to wear my particular outfit and my particular hat. But if I only had one shirt and I just washed it by hand and I just hung it up, it'd be probably better for not throwing clothes away. The clothes would last longer and then I wouldn't have to like wash a giant pile of clothing. And so it's, we, it's this, the consumerism has, has taken over and we want more clothes and we need to wash all of the clothes. And then we need to have everything be sterile in the hospitals and the hotels need to wash all of their linen and all their bedding. And so it is this beast of consumerism. And we want to live this life of excess because people don't starve and there's no famines. And so it's not a terrible thing, but how to do it in a way that's sustainable is important. What's the name of the action machine that you're and building? We're we're thinking about we're thinking about the ultramatic, but I think we're open to changing. That. Okay, so no, nothing's locked in yeah, yet. Yeah, So for now, the ultramatic. And you're going after industry space, like the big washer, like the big laundromat. Well, space probably first? um no, not like laundry mats. It's so a lot of laundry is sent into like uh, an assembly line. And so they'll have these like tunnel washers, tunnel dryers, um, they'll have these presses. Um, and so we're thinking, um, we've been talking to an industrial manufacturer, um, we're hoping to develop some sort of partnership with them to build out a module that would save energy um, and probably fit into their line, um, increase throughput, um, maybe cut their dryer times down, um, and they'd be able to get more through there, as well as probably save tens of thousands. Some dollars. So machine, does it work off a of battery? You have to plug into an electrical outlet. How's it work? Yeah. Plug into an electrical outlet. If we did do something battery operated like that, it would be interesting to create maybe a more in the field camping design. When people get their socks wet hiking, that's kind of like you yeah. could lose a foot. So <laughs> so. I'm thinking like if you're washing clothes by hand, mm -hmm. what are the chance of you having electricity around, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. Yeah. And so I think we won't start there, but I think that's a place that we want to grow through. I think we'll start in these more industrial places where okay. it fits in and really, really generate. Um, our vision right now is to start more high-end um, and then come down and create more and more affordable products. Okay. 
And so how are you going to fix like companies or people give up their Whirlpool washer and dryer for your product? Yeah. And I don't think that's the goal. I think it's, we're targeting more like the 25 million Americans that don't have a washer and dryer. Okay. And so if your experience is, I have to walk to the laundromat, you're like, anything is better than walking to the laundromat. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, have you actually built any of these yet? Like the, all the way through, or you mm-hmm. try to do test test models of them? Mm-hmm. I think it's so far, it's just been like the ultrasound. We're focused on the core technology. Okay. And then the uh, idea with that, that it's scalable. And so whatever the outside looks like, it could look like anything. And so, and that's kind of where the market comes in. It's like, okay, we have this core technology. We can put it inside your RV. We have this core technology. It can go into these industrial spaces. And so we're mostly focused on- RV would be a good place. Yeah, all right, so yeah, something like RV that. RV good place, yeah. And so it'll, it's a very flexible design. And so it can fit inside a variety of things. So what the outside looks like, I think that's the easier part. What the inside works and works really, really well is what our main focus is. So, so far since you've been doing this, has a process been faster than you thought? Just about a speed or way slower than you thought? Way slower. <laughs> super, super slow. <laughs> so how do you how do you deal with that frustration, you know? I well, I think it's not because I'm always working. And so I think I'm not frustrated at all. I think it's um it's been a pleasure to learn so much. And I think I really enjoy the journey. I think a lot of people start things and they're like, oh, I want to be at the end. I want to have my degree. I want to be at this finish line. And it's like if you're going to school, enjoy school. Like it's not about getting the degree. It's about the information that you're learning. It's about the people that you're connecting with. There's all of these clubs and all of these, all of these resources that you should be leveraging while you're having this experiencing. And if you're paying all this money and not leveraging those resources to their fullest potential, this that's part of life. Like it's not just about getting to the next end state because the end state is just a piece of paper. It's not that piece of paper. People are like, what, why I paid all this money for a piece of paper? No, you're paying for the every single yeah, day. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Experience, yeah. So totally random question, right? So you recently changed your hair color, right? <laughs> was that, was that, were you like kind of peer pressured by the other college students? Like, Hey, <laughs> you know, change your color, fit in more, you know, be like us or something you just like did on a whim. <laughs> aware about how I am perceived um, and thinking about that. Um, I think like I was catering to maybe an older conservative generation a little bit more when I had a maybe more um, like reddish brown hair color. Um, and I feel like with this, I'm catering to maybe Gen Z a little bit mm. more. Um, and I feel like it changes my appearance. I am half Filipino. Mm. I think with the reddish hair color, I appeared very white. I think with this color, it makes me a little bit more alternative. And I think um, just speaking to different generations and having different people connect with you in different ways, your physical appearance does draw different people in and yeah. does make different people feel more comfortable around you. I find that Black people are more comfortable around me with colored hair. They'll approach me more and comfortable complement my outfit. Um, younger people are more comfortable around me. Um, and so it does change who you interact with. I feel like the the older people maybe don't like it as much. And I feel like I don't need to please that segment of the yeah. population right now. I am at the university interacting with a lot of younger people. And so that's the generation that I'm catering to. And I also, it, I like I like how they both look. Yeah. I, I I think it's fun. I think it matches my skin tone. Um, and it, it's it's just kind of a fun thing, to, fun do. thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so talk about water shortages. A lot, a lot of people mm-hmm. realize that a lot of places in the world, like even the United States, Arizona is having a water shortage mm-hmm. in Nevada. I think I make this up maybe Las Vegas, they, these get the water from Lake Mead. It's like decreased like 85% of water. Yeah. Lake Mead is so bad, they'll find like hundreds of dead bodies in Lake Mead now, right? <laughs> so like you're like crazy, right? So yeah. talk about this water yeah. flow. You're, 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 you're having to have to like solve, right? With this product. Yes. And just talking to different um, municipalities, I feel like that was part of our discovery, customer discovery process was kind of figuring out where a lot of these, how different people and different municipalities dealt with their water issues. Um, At Seattle, it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue. We talked to people in San Diego where um, their water bill would spike at certain times of the day. So if they wanted to do it at 7 p.m., it would increase in price and they couldn't do it at 7 p.m. And it was interesting. People would say, oh, talk to this person or talk to this person. And honestly, I would say the day-to-day American doesn't feel it too much they are sheltered from a lot of these things and like despite having these water shortages i would say a lot of them uh feel insulated i feel like um my family in colorado they're all a lot of the water comes from an aquifer but it can get really really dry there and they'll have them cut back on their water and and water will be more of a precious resource and so it's interesting how it changes um but then you'll talk to different people someone else in the same area and they they will have a totally different experience and they will be like, well, I am like, I shower whatever I want. It doesn't matter to me. And, and maybe they don't have as many kids or they don't have as much stuff in there. So they have very, very different experiences 
even in the same location between people. I know. I think in a couple of years ago, almost it was LA where they had like the water trips. You couldn't, you couldn't water your lawn anymore yeah. or doing this stuff. Yeah. But all the rich people like still like using yeah. water. Like, yes. And they're like, we'll just pay the fine, you know, yes. whatever, you know. <laughs> Not saying, hey, you, you can pay the fine or whatever, but you're still like, on the yes. water right it's for everybody right yeah yeah and there's a mindset of people like this ridiculous yes and so some people are just uh, just not aware of the problem at all and it'll be the same person and so and i think if you're in maybe a more low income low resourced area i think you feel it a lot more despite someone who might live in the same city as you maybe it doesn't feel it at all and a lot of places like don't even have like drink or water right you have to go like literally walk miles to yeah. clean water and walk yeah. back you know which is like with us is like like if where you go in the united states the water is relatively safe, right? Yes. Don't be wrong. It might be kind of like browner sometimes or like mm -hmm. maybe like taste weird, but yeah. it's it's not going to kill you, right? Yeah. Where other places like the water would literally kill you. Literally kill you. I And I do encounter people that have a lot of fear around water. I talked to my friend recently and he was like, don't drink the water. I got you bottled water. He's like, I'm from Vietnam. We don't drink water anywhere. I went somewhere and I got this terrible sickness and like, you have to be so careful with water. <laughs> so for... So your washing machine, it does uses no water at all, right? It does use water. I feel like it's been out there that it doesn't use water. Um, and I think we made sure to put in our pitch like three or four times because I think we kept hearing that impression. I think people maybe got like, um, like in Star Trek, they have these sonic showers that don't <laughs> use water and they would bring to us these things that they heard. And I feel like we mentioned it a lot that it does use water. Um, we're hoping to recapture a lot of the water through this atomization process. And so use, I think it's where we plan for it to be circular. Um, so all of the water in the machine just stays in the machine. Okay. And then, uh, what kind of water does it use? Does that have to be distilled water? Can you be like any kind of like salt water? Mm. Like water the tab does that does the water matter and i think that's a lot of the research that we're doing we don't think the water matters too much but the water does affect cavitation and so depending on the type of water it will change like the cleanling the clothes which is something that we are interested in no matter what water you use it doesn't affect the process from your research so far what do you think that like the what's the word i'm looking for the life cycle of the machine is going to be like, can you use it for like 20 years, five years, forever? We're hoping we would love to make this very modular design. We were very inspired by the 3D printer. And so it's a solid state device. Unlike um, a washing machine that has all of these belts and motors, it won't have all these belts and motors. Um, the electricity goes through this ceramic piece and the ceramic expands and contracts, which drives these pressure waves through the water. Um, so that it's very user friendly. When we did all of our user interviews, people like to work on their washing machines. They're an investment when they break down. A lot of people do take them apart and are like, how do I fix my machine? And we were surprised about people's um, interest in the ability to work on their machines. And then as engineers, we do, we, we like hearing that. We want people to feel comfortable working on their machines. And so we would like to make a design where if a part breaks down, we can just send it to you and be like, hey, this is, you can do it. It's very, very easy. And just having the information out there for it to be accessible, even open source. So people could add different modifications to the machine. Like, okay, I figured it out. So I can set this thing up in in my closet this way and, and having it maybe be this community around this more modern washer and dryer. What is the machine made out of? Um, I, we're not sure yet. And so the ceramics, uh, the core of the technology are ceramics. They're these um, piezo elements. Um, a lot of times piezo elements have a lot of lead in them. And so that's making sure that we're very careful with what goes into the ceramics and developing these transducers in such a way that they're effective, but also environmental. Do you foresee like in the future, like having like, you know, Autopia franchises, like all over the United States where someone go to like a, what's we'll like a store in Dallas, Texas or Denver, Colorado, or like the little town county missouri is yes. that you foresee something like that we um i think dyson is our ideal we okay. really like the okay. way that dyson has done it and so we um, like if we could similar i feel like it would be dyson um but to start in this very um space where where people want it and be very accessible i think if you combined dyson and prusa the 3d printer company mm -hmm. i think that would be our ideal is this kind of um to create a luxury washer and dryer but that is modular so you could just buy a piece of it in a really affordable way but then you have these add-ons that make it a nicer experience so let's say you know tomorrow you know you find out you have a, a, a rich uncle that give you like 25 million dollars right who are you going to be first hire? Going to be, are they going to be like you know traditional starter like, like marketing, sales, tech developers, or are you going to bring on like actual scientists? I have a list of people. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Yeah. Who, who are you going to first hire? Going to be yeah. You interact with these people and you see their work, and you're just like, 
it, I care very much about team dynamics and the way that people work together. And I feel like there's people that I've worked with and they've been so excellent that if I could bring them on, it's like, okay, I put you in charge of this. You're brilliant yeah, at this. I do the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, like people always say, I think it's called ABC, all of your clothes. I'm like, no, ABR, always be recruiting, right? Always be I, have, I have a list, like my first 20 jobs. I had like two or three people on mind for each one of those jobs, right? Yes. And you can meet anybody. You can like meet them at like, like a Starbucks barista someplace or yes. some just come just like oh shit you're pretty fucking yes. smart i need to like, keep track of you right <laughs> mm -hmm. and i and there's people i keep tabs on them I, like and check like how are you doing how things yeah. are going and if i got that 25 million dollars like they, these are the people that i'm like hey like what what do i need how much do i need to pay you please yes Join tell me what you want i'll give you yeah. whatever you want yeah <laughs> and they're just great people and they just make an excellent team yeah um so do you, you have any more pitch competitions you're going to go to in the near future? Um, right now we're focused on applying to the National Science Foundation's uh, Small Business Innovation um, Research Grant. Um, and so that's our focus. We might do some more pitch competitions after we are, like, we're in a very much um, deep technical development phase. After we come out of this technical development phase, we might do a couple more pitch competitions. Um, our main focus right now is we would like to get a contract with this industrial manufacturer. We want to show them the technology that they need to sign a contract with us. So that's really what we're hoping for. That's our current focus is to get a contract there. Um, and then as we go into maybe several years in the future where we're designing a more residential product, um, maybe we we launch it South by Southwest. So we go to CES and we we unveil a more residential product. But right now it's um, focused on more of the core technology, technical development, and then hopefully getting this partnership. And you take part in the, the, the I think it's called the, the hardware part of UW. I thought, mm -hmm. I thought it was actually a hardware part. They had like a yes. machines and stuff. You take part in, you use that also? Yes. Um, there's Hardware Hall. That's the Hardware yes, Hall. Hardware yes. Hall, yes. And that's inside of Fluke Hall, which is part of- And the they actually resources. have an actual real 3D machine, 3D printer. Yeah, they, they have a ton of stuff and it's yeah. really excellent. And they're always updating. They have a list. They're like, we asked them to get a little injection molder. They got a little injection molder, a mini vacuum former. And so when we ask them to buy equipment, they'll buy equipment. Um, but re university resources are great. Um, if there are research and tests that you want to do, um, you, I think they're available to, um, so as an outside company, if you need to do testing, you can find different departments at the lab. Um, and so um, we recently needed to test the strength of some of the bonds that we are creating. And so the mechanical engineering department has this machine that does lap shear testing. And so you contact the lab manager, you say, hey, I'm interested in this machine. It's a certain amount of money to use these machines. And then you can go do testing on whatever product. So in the future, we're able to like mass produce these. Is a plan to have one big factory like here in the United States somewhere, like little small factories, mm -hmm. different locations? Are you going to like, like, I know a lot of people like outsource to China, make factory in China. What, what's your plan with that? I think, um, I think we don't want to outsource to China. I think we would like to keep it local. A lot of washing machines are made because they're so heavy. Um, they don't usually ship them. And so a lot of washing machines are made in North America and those ones have the better reputation. People do like it. And there's a lot of funding for thing, bringing things back into America right now. And so I think we can lean into that funding and manufacture in America. At the same time, we have been talking to people in Switzerland and in Japan, and they do have good reputations as well. I feel like the Swiss people pride themselves on their manufacturing. And then they did have this really nice open source thought when I talked to them as well. And so there are, there could possibly reasons to manufacture in other countries. Um, we'll be at the University of Washington for a while. Um, uh, my co-founder has a bunch of property in Spokane. We could maybe manufacture in that property. So it's very, we're very open right now. We can do, we'll do as much as we can at the University of Washington right now before we make our next move. And do you say y'all applying for an SBI, SBIR grant? Mm -hmm, yes. How long in the process are you with that? So we were invited to, um, so we sent in our project pitch and then we were invited to send in a proposal. And so we've been developing our proposal. Um, we'll submit that by July. And then it takes like five to seven months to hear back whether you were accepted or not. And your daughter is six years old, right? She's six years old. So how do you do this? How do you make sure like, you know, like she knows what you're doing, like, you know, you're, you're a female entrepreneur, like kind of like, be that role model for her and, and let her know, hey, mommy's doing something different than most other people are doing. Um, I think right now she just, just thinks I work for the University of Washington because <laughs> I'm there so much much like she sees she's been to startup hall she's been to hardware hall and so i'll take her to different places and i'll show her um i think she likes more what taylor does than i do <laughs> um she asked me she, the other day she's like oh you work for the w the w <laughs> is uh, tearing our housing down whose side are you on and i'm like oh but the uw also owns our housing that's, a, that's hilarious the w that's hilarious <laughs> and they do you have like an elementary 
Which school would you go to on the UW you know, campus? Well, Olympic Hills Elementary. Okay. Um, and so that's kind of north. Um, Seattle recently changed their uh, geozone laws. And so even though we moved to the UW housing, I was allowed to keep her um, at the Olympic Hills Elementary. And I really loved that elementary school. I feel like their programs are so excellent. I feel like they did all these um, remodels. And so um, it's a the school feels newer. There's lots of colors. It's a really nice school. There's lots of good light. Um, the teachers are really, really excellent. And because um, I started her during the pandemic, I think a lot of parents held back their children. Um, I went and had and started her in kindergarten. Um, her class size is smaller. And I think her class size will be smaller in, as long as she's. And so your bachelor's. Yes. What is that like? It's a great question. <laughs> what is that? Um, I think at the lowest level, I think you're kind of studying like how electrons work, but it breaks into so many disciplines. I feel like the more that you dive into any field, the less you realize that you know about anything. Um, and so it's hard to cover so much material in such a short period of time. Some of it is signal processing. Um, some of it is waves. Some, uh like the grid system, how does your power get to your grid? Um, some of it's communication between objects, some of it's like computer architecture. Um, so there's a lot that goes into electrical engineering. And then a lot of people kind of pick a focus and go more into that focus. With ultrasound, it's a little bit more, um, we're understanding how these signals are being processed. Um, but then there's a lot of physics that happens in there as well. And so I think um, picking a thing just gives you a broad understanding. So then you're able to kind of know what the foundations are and then go deeper into something yourself. How do you do your schedule on a weekly basis? Like, you know, like, do you like, it's all my calendar. Do you work like 12 hour days? Do you take weekends off? Do you like, I never work, you know, past five o'clock. How do you do that? Cause people do it different ways. I live and die by my calendar. And, but then at the start of every week, my co-founder and I will make a schedule. Um, I think I was working a lot more. I was working like all of the time. And then my husband had to step up a lot. He's been really, really great about that. Um, and he, he was there. I feel like I was gone. I was never home. Um, now I've come back and I think I have a little bit more schedule now where I do take more weekends off and then I'll take more evenings off. Um, but I, it, it, it changes a lot depending on the needs of the company. What kind of tools do you use on a daily basis? Like you use like Slack, Asana, mm -hmm. like pen and paper. How do you like do that kind of stuff? Um, I would say most of our stuff is inside of Google Drive. And we think um, accessibility to information is really, really important. So what, whatever is easiest and fastest first. And so we documentation is everything. Keep everything documented. We also use Trello um, just to kind of like have a task board and manage tasks. We have an Excel spreadsheet with a schedule. We have... I just managed to sync all of my calendars. They still didn't sync on my phone, but I was really, really proud because I had, had trouble getting them to talk to each other for so long. And so all my calendars are synced. Um, I also, uh, I use things like when to meet, um, I use discord. I use, I'm part of like 10 different Slack channels. And so I, I do all of the things you can reach me on LinkedIn. I have Facebook, Instagram. I'm, a, I'm everywhere. <laughs> so in the future, you actually start hiring people. What kind of characteristics are you looking for your people to bring them on to make sure they match what you're, you're trying to do? I think, um, uh, I think I, to me, it is working with people. So I think it would be just small projects. Um, if we work together on a small project and to me, it is a lot about making sure that they're growing in a way that they want to grow. Um, I think I talked to someone recently and I think they were excited about Ultropia, but I think the work that they would actually be doing wasn't in the direction that they wanted to be growing. Um, and so I am very cognizant about making sure that people are happy to do their work because I think it can be very, very fun and enjoyable. And if you're doing work that you're loved, you love doing, like you're so much more passionate and excited about it. And so to me, it's just about connecting people with the work that they want to do. So successful is very subjective, right? Yes. Since you've been involved in startups entrepreneurship here in Seattle, what are some of the metrics you've seen some of the successful entrepreneurs have? Um, I think it can be all over the place. I think, um, people do learn from experience. Um, I think you can't deny luck. I, I would say you have to be a lot of it's right place, right time. The markets were looking for this solution. And sometimes it's like, I happen to have this right solution. I was in the right place at the right time. I think honestly, when it, when it breaks down to it, most people are lucky. 
And I think that's, and they'll, and they'll go back and they'll give you advice. And I've heard people like they get really, really far on luck and then they'll go and they're like, oh, I want to start a company and give other people advice. Like I had something. And then when they try to do it again, they realize it was, it was luck. Like I, I didn't really have a framework that I could like move forward on. And a lot of people do want to try to apply these frameworks that work for particular things. And they, and they do work pretty well, like lean and agile and a lot of the stuff you can apply and it is successful. But at the same time, I think a lot of, a lot of people who are successful in the traditional sense are lucky. A lot of people don't realize too, like it works like this. Like you might meet like someone at a, a summer event, right? And you you have a good conversation. And two months later, I got to meet someone else. Oh shit! I remember Amy's doing that. Let me connect you to, and then you know, something comes out of that, right? Yes. I think that's so, and that I feel like that's part of luck too. It's just like finding the right people, and, and it's like putting yourself out there. Working hard is valid, um, and so I feel like doing going to these network events is a way of putting yourself out there and way of finding these people to who want to work on these same projects with you, and then something develops from those relationships. And so that's why networking is important, like so you can find these people and find these connections. How do you deal with criticism, right? Because I think some people criticize you. They from a good place, you know. Other people criticize you because, like, you know, either they're a hater or there's like have a bad attitude, right? How do you, how do you like, first of all, like, how do you decide, okay, this is from a good place, not a good place, and just deal with criticism overall? I think you have to think about why people are criticizing you. I would say do not take criticism at face value. Usually there's something deeper with why people are criticizing you. So you have to think back to like, okay, who's this person? Where do they come from? What experience did they have? And then what did I say? And how did I word it? Am I projecting maybe more nervous today? Am I projecting more aggressive and defensive today? How am I feeling? And what am I saying? And maybe I didn't give them the full picture. Maybe I only gave them a part because I didn't want to share. And maybe I was more defensive today. So they are, people only are able to react to the information that you tell them. And there might be this deeper thing and they don't see it, but you've only told them three things and they have this other experience and they can speak to the three things that you said that you were willing to put on the table. And so they speak to that. And, and that's from their experience and they have been successful in this way. And so understanding the full picture um, and that what you're being criticized on is just a small part of what you're seeing of each other. I remember reading somewhere like you're actually three people. One is a person you think you are to the person everyone else thinks you are. And then the third one, the person you actually are, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so next. So when this, how do you decide, like, do you have a product roadmap? What are you doing? Mm, I think we've laid out several product roadmaps. I think we have, um, and they, and they, they're flexible and they change. Mm -hmm. Um, I think right now with the SBAR process, there's very specific milestones that we've laid out. Like, okay, we're going to test this part of the technology. We're going to test this part of the technology. We're going to make sure the transducers can do this. And if we meet these milestones, that unlocks like the next phase of this grant. Um, I think you can do things a lot like uh, faster, but we want to be very careful with what we're making um, and how we're making it. Um, and so it, to us, this is like six months is very fast. Yeah. <laughs> like, and so we feel like um, this is how we've chosen to do things. And right now we're doing within the outlines of SBIR. And then next we're hoping to work with this manufacturer and do things um, in the way that they do it. So what's the benefit of getting awarded this SBIR grant? Mm -hmm. um, I think thinking through this process, I think is really, really healthy. Um, a lot of it because it already aligns with the uh, something the way that we do things already, whether or not we get the SBIR. Just at this stage, I think doing this planning is really, really helpful because our, um, our strategy has changed a lot. Um, right now, our goal is to work with this manufacturer. And so uh, making sure that we're all on the same page and then the next steps that we take are the steps that take us in the direction that we want to go. Um, as well as the the funding helps as well. Um, at this stage, it's a $275,000 grant. And at the next stage, it's a million dollar grant with a matching program. So the manufacturer could potentially say, hey, I, I'm, I do believe in this technology. I do want to develop it and I do want to use it. And then they could also make an investment in that as well. Um, so that is what we're hoping for. Um, but we will see how the technology pans out. <laughs> and you've done like no fundraising, like the Aluda fundraising, right? Mm -hmm. I took on a little bit of funds. Um, I did the Founders Institute program, which was really, really excellent. We were very early on. Um, and I feel like as engineers, we didn't really have any experience. And the program was really, um, went really fast and we learned a lot. And at the end of the program, I think um, we were awarded a, um, a I guess, uh, I think they did a safe note. And so we, we signed... Um, an agreement with Loyal, mm -hmm. um, and they gave us ten thousand dollars in exchange for reporting. And so we would send them company reports, and they gave us ten thousand dollars. And then when we do our first raise, then they would get equity in our okay. company. Okay. Okay. Besides that, nothing else, right? Yes. Are you gonna have to do a fundraise? 
to, to get to where you want to go to? Or do you think you do it go out through customer financing, so to speak? If we, if we don't get SBAR, I think we'll be put in a position where we will start doing uh, business accelerators instead. So there have been uh, great accelerator programs that we've been looking at. We've been looking at um, uh California has one called Hacks, which looks really good as hardware focused. Um, there's one called Miracle Fund based out of China, which looks really good. There's one in New York that is a manufacturing program that looks really good. They're all associated with a certain amount of funding, so connections in hardware and manufacturing. And then at the end, you do um, a raise. We also did Venture Well, which also is similar. We did the first stage of that. And then their third round is um, a dilutive raise. And so there would be these different channels that we would do a more dilutive raise through if SBIR did not work out. So entrepreneur, if you get all this advice, right? How do you pressure like, you no, know, of course, most advice is comes from a good intent, you know, but it's from, from like stuff from the lens. How do you like, you know, decide for all this advice and, and use what you need? Mm -hmm. I think that's mm, it, that's it can be very very hard to do because I think you you are filtering stuff through you and I think there's a lot of self confidence that you need to have you need to trust yourself um, and your long term vision um, I think I've seen people who every time they get a piece of advice they change and they change and they change and I think if someone has more experience than you and they represent a model of where you want to go. I think it's okay to leverage other people's experiences and you should be leveraging other people's experiences at the same time thinking about what people want. I think if you're going to listen to anybody, it should be your customer, the people that want to buy your product. And so if you're going to filter it and you need to filter it, filter it by what your customer is telling you. Sometimes your own internal voice and you fall in love with the, the solution that you're developing. And it's very, very easy to do that. Um, and the customer could love it for different reasons than you love it. And so I think if you're going to filter and you need to filter, do it by what the customer wants. How did y'all do product market fit for, for what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's so many stages of it. I would say we're still at the problem solution fit. Like we've definitely found problem solution fit. I think until we start, um, as we start building out this technology, we'll see if it's product, this particular product is a right fit for this manufacturer and their, their clients. Um, and so it's, it's a several stage process and it's very, very iterative. And so this process of doing customer discovery through the innovation core program, um, is very, very helpful. If you have access to, um, a resources like this, the national science foundation hosts these workshops. I recommend participating in them. They're very, very excellent. Um, and you go through this process where you put all your assumptions on the lean canvas business model. So you can do this without, without using the national science foundation. And so you put all your assumptions, all your hypotheses, um, onto the lean canvas business model. And you say, I think this, I think this, and then you go and you interview a bunch of people to test your assumptions, but you have to be careful about how you interview people. Um, I think a good book for that is, um, uh, something with mom, the mom test. So the mom test is a good book for, um, making sure, um, that you're not taking your biases into these interviews because it can be very easy to, pose your questions in these interviews in such a way that's like, my product's great. And you're fishing for compliments and people don't want to hurt your feelings. So they'll tell you that your product's great, but that's not what you needed to hear. And so there's ways that you can word these interviews so you can validate your hypotheses without just uh, patting your ego. Yeah. So you're, you're talking about the sum, but can you go to more detail about how your company got started, mm. what your focus now and your big future vision of it is? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started this, um, my senior year of electrical engineering, um, there was a business plan competition at Eastern Washington University where my, my co-founder and I were going. Um, everything was online. I was actually in a satellite program of Eastern Washington University. And when we came online, I got really, really um, involved into the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Um, I had started, I had tried to start a chapter, but it didn't go very well. And then when I was connected, then there were more people and they were all online. And so it actually turned out really, really well. Um, we made like nine projects. We made like a drivable couch car. We made a drone swarm. We made a Skittle sorting machine. We connected. Wait, wait a minute. You, did you say a Skittle sorting a, machine? A Skittle sorting machine. Yes. Is that, do you still have that around somewhere? Yes. My co-founder has it. If you're interested, I can oh, send man, you. That'd be pretty, pretty cool to see. <laughs> yes. It sorts Skittles by color. <laughs> that was the first project. And so we did all of these projects and we worked really, really well together. Um, and so after completing all of these projects with my co-founder, or I guess it was as um, a, a 
group as a club. It was really, really excellent. Um, and then my co-founder and I had been working together on all of these projects and executing them. And we applied to the university's um, business plan competition. Um, and he had applied the year before with um, a different idea he had, but he hadn't, he applied more from the engineering brain instead of like this customer discovery, solving a, a need. Um, and the director of the program was really, really good about um, onboarding people onto the program and teaching them um, um, what you should know about entrepreneurship. And so I think um, he was the foundation for a lot of our success was doing this first uh, business plan competition. And then we kind of followed all his steps. We did some customer discovery um, and we built this giant, um, our, our first like prototype, which was a, a giant closet that was in my dad's place in Colorado. And it had all these trays and it sorted all these clothes and it's nothing like what we'll build now, but it's, so we, we came over spring bake, we built this giant thing. Um, and that we won, um, $16,000 from this first business plan competition and it went really well. It was really validating to our success. Um, and I think our co my co-founder and I got really, really good at this. And then we were very good at working together. And I think we just continued that relationship. What is something like, as you're talking about entrepreneurs, an entrepreneur, like you really struggled with, right? You had a hard time with it. Now you're like, how in the world do I struggle with this? This is the simplest, <laughs> easiest thing in the world. How was this such a pain for me? I think it, like entrepreneurship is a process of discovery and a process of learning. I think you do come in with a lot of assumptions about people are similar or want the same things that you do. And then stepping outside of yourself and talking to more people and just getting that perspective that's outside of your head. It takes a long time to, to get outside of your own head. And you come in with a lot of assumptions like, oh, wait, I need to do it like this. And I need this money. And I think you think that like, oh, people just get millions of dollars and it falls from the sky and they're successful. And then as you step into it, you're like, okay, one minute, I'm, I'm trying to solve a problem for a customer and create real value in the world. And now I think I'm on the other side of it where I'm like, no, I don't want to take on any dilutive capital. If I don't need to take on dilutive capital, then I don't want to. Um, and so as you learn more, and I think you, you realize what your, your real value is that you can create and that you can provide, and then you, you lean into it, but it takes, a, it takes a long time to learn yourself. <laughs> What's your advice to new entrepreneur? Like, you know, they have an idea, they don't have product market fit. They're like, I, I have a problem I need, I think needs to be solved. What's mm -hmm. your advice for them? I would say, write all your hypotheses onto the lean canvas, do the customer discovery. If you had true, if you can write out your value proposition, like this is my value proposition. And it's something that you feel like people really want that they'll pay money for. I would say, um, find the resources and people to help you build that out. Don't build it in a vacuum. There are um, connections that you can have. So I think you can test that, that product market fit in a really easy way. Just take your idea, test it. If it's a good idea, find the people and the resources and, and leverage that for your idea. Let's suppose, you know, same person, right. And they're like kind of introverted. They wouldn't know anyone. Like how do you advise them? Like how do they go find people to talk to? Mm -hmm. I would say if you're more introverted, I think you there's being introverted is, um, I think, I think it's a very Seattle trait. I think there's a lot of people here who are introverted and I think, um, and, and a lot of people resonate with that. And so don't feel like you need to be this hyper-confident person who comes in and dominates the room all the time. Like there are a lot of introverts who have founded a lot of companies and people respect them for the ideas that they have. And so I think creating a space where all ideas are heard, I think, especially as a leader, if you have a lot of introverts on your team, like they have such good ideas and it's your job as a leader to get their, your ideas out of these introverts. And if you're an introvert who has decided, hey, I want to take a leadership position, then it's like you need to find ways that you're able to share these ideas and bring up the people around you. Uh, I would probably recommend finding a co-founder if you don't feel like you want to personally develop the skills to be more extroverted, then maybe it would be easier to find someone else who is able to help you leverage and, and take some of these ideas out of your head and, and bring them to the masses. Um, but, and there's so many ways to do things. So I wouldn't say introverts, you can do it, get help. <laughs> so from your perspective, what are some pros and cons about the Seattle tech startup scene? Um, I think the every startup scene is very, very different. Um, I think as a like female tech founder, the, those three things, uh, I think do very, very well here. I think before when I was, I was just like, cleaning people's houses like nobody like doing entrepreneurship in like the more traditional sense is like oh I have a small business I do massages I, that was more difficult I would say but like getting my electrical engineering degree getting my MBA now there's so much support for what I'm doing 
Um, and so I think I've checked the boxes for a lot of people and things that like they want to support like women in tech doing, putting their ideas out there. And there's a reason for it. Like there's like washers and dryers aren't maybe the sexiest thing to work at. I feel like a lot of the men that I talk to want to go work in aerospace and they're not innovating in things like laundry. And so designing the world for women, I think is, is really important. And you need females in those spaces to design these products. <laughs> Is there like a, I would say like a word of laundry or like this magazine certification? Is that actually like, so there's a word of science, word of tech. Is there like a word of laundry, so to speak? There is a world of laundry and it's not very, um, there's not that much innovation that really happens into the world of laundry. I think we wanted to go to a laundry conference, but it it's not happening until 2005. Like I'll have my MBA done by then. And I feel like it's, um, it, it, I feel like it's a, relatively stagnant area but it's an old area like it's people make money and I feel like whenever we talk to people they're like like this is like like my laundromat pays the bills this is what pays the bills this is like a it's a foundation so the world of laundry doesn't go away it's always there it's a very strong industry everybody needs to wash their clothes we're generating more clothes we have more fast fashion people don't want to wash their clothes by hand so it's an industry that's growing but it's not industry that's always innovating so can you talk about this I don't think most people realize like how much textile waste there is in the world, right? A lot of people, like, they buy a new outfit every day or every week, and they throw the old ones out. Can you talk some about what you know about the textile waste that's going on in the world? I think there's a lot of textile waste that's happening. I've recently subscribed to um, Rent the Runway. Okay. <laughs> and so it's a it's a uh, clothing service where you, you rent the clothes, and the best thing about it is that you don't have to do laundry. And so I got this dress that I'm wearing from Rent the Runway. And so I, like, I select like five outfits and then I, they send them to me and I send them back and they wash them and then I wear them to little events or talks. And so like my like concern with that, I'll be like, I was like, man, I don't want to wash something that's dirty. Right. I mean, wash something that's dirty. Like, like, how do you make, I mean, sure they tell you to wash whatever, or whatever, keeps, but, but how do you really ensure that like this dress, <laughs> it's actually clean, clean. And you don't have like no, the dead skin cells of the previous person. Right. That's one thing I would be like freaked out about. And I think, um, I, I live with a six-year-old and everything. Well, okay. <laughs> I mean, that's a little bit different, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a little bit, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's a good point. So everything, like, clean to, I think maybe my standards for clean have dropped off quite a bit since I have a very sticky child. <laughs> no, no spots, no stains, yeah. it's good enough. <laughs> yeah. As a mom, I feel like they send it to me in a side of, like, it comes in these um plastic bags, and so I feel like they're getting rid of the plastic bags, and they're getting rid of a lot of the plastic that they use. They're going to send them folded now, and so they're, they're trying to be more conscious about the waste that they're creating. Um, but a lot of people do. There's interviewing people. Um, people will have different, like, your laundry machines are really tough on your clothes, mm -hmm. and so people have different perspectives on it. I know lots of people who will just buy clothing. They're like, I don't care if it gets destroyed in the washing machine. That's fine. It's so cheap. I'll just buy new outfits. Yeah. Um, and there's other people who were like, I never put this in the washing machine. Yeah. I made this by hand. This is my wool. Yeah. My grandmother made oh, this. Oh, they wash like gentle, gentle, gentle no gentle. soap, never dry it. So laundry machines can contribute to a lot of that fashion waste. So we are helping to make a more gentle washer dryer that you can put more things into. Um, I uh, rented a sequence dress. I'm like, I'm so glad that I don't have to wash this sequence dress. It would get so sweaty and I would never wash it. And it would just hang in my closet because I have no idea how to wash it. And I think there's so many items like that, that people have, and they'd love to wear, but they have no idea how to wash them or they have to go to the dry cleaners really, really frequently. Um, and so being able to wash a lot of these things at home is something that we'd like to open up to people. Yeah, I, I think the runaway is a good example of company that, you know, you would think like, there's no way they can make it, right? But they're actually like value over like, like 10, 15 billion dollars, right? Like you would think, uh, who's what, who's gonna like rent a dress for a couple of days to send it back, right? There's you no, know, just back in, the, like back in the day, you know, like I, you want me to rent my room out to some random stranger from like freaking China, Mexico? I'm not doing that. Or yeah. like, you know, even Uber, like. Yes. <laughs> even though it was funny, like I had an aunt one time came visit me and I was like, let's go get Uber. Uber, I don't know that guy. Like, have you, have you rode a taxi before? Yeah. Well, what's the difference, right? <laughs> Except we was are cleaner, more, you know, more on time, right? Yes. No, it's so, and then once you step into this like world of shared resources, mm -hmm. it's so nice. I, I, I love this clothing is more high quality. Some of the stuff is like $700. I'm not yeah. going to spend $700 on a dress, yeah. but be able to just rent the dress and, and wear it as much of the times and feel really good with it. And like the material is nicer than like my clothing. Like it's thicker. It has pockets. My clothing doesn't have pockets. So what happens if you forget to return it? You just look at a link fee or something like <laughs> they come knocking your door and they give me this dress back. How's that work? They recently, they delivered a package, but I never got it. I think someone took it. Um, and they were actually really, really 
really nice for me for all of that clothing. I would have, I'd cancel the service. I'd be like, well, I like, that was expensive. If it's going to get stolen. Like I'm not, I can't afford that. Um, but they just sent out, uh, they filed a claim with UPS. And so I think UPS, they have insurance for that and they're covering that. Um, and so I think they're, they're pretty good. If you, I'm not sure what happens if you lose an item, they may charge you for it, but a lot of the stuff is discounted because okay. it's been used. It's actually pretty affordable from its original price tag. Okay. They use like actual like famous fashion designers that design all this stuff. I think it seems it's nice clothes. I think it's like um, I, I think yeah. So some of the stuff I think I've seen um, from Rio, a lot of stuff by like uh, I think the Kardashians have clothing on there. I think it's um. So I think there's a really wide range, and a lot of times I'm looking at the brand. I'm like, who is this? This is excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and question like like what's your business model? How, are you still fair your pricing model? Mm -hmm. And how are y'all actually going to make money off this? Mm -hmm. And I feel like this is such an interesting question because there could be so many business models out there. And I think it's like something that people should explore. Um, I think initially, um, and I think this is something that we're figuring out now, we'll either maybe license our core technology or build out these initial arrays. Um, and I think we're, we'll figure that out with the industry with. Um, um, they don't have the experience in ultrasound. And so maybe we would build the ultrasound arrays and then sell them those ultrasound arrays. And then once we really refine this process of developing these ultrasound arrays, um, start putting that into our personal technology. So an, initially it'll start as either um, licensing or we're selling these ultrasound arrays to this manufacturer. And so that's how it will start. Um, and then as it evolves into like these more residential units, it'll change significantly. And are you and co-founder are both at this full time? Yes, he is a master's student in electrical engineering. Um, he's taking a break right now um, from his master's degree, and he's been focusing more on the company. Um, and so this is, uh, but he also works with me at the Applied Physics Lab as well. So how does Atropia fail? Mm. That's it. Um, I think it fails. I think the most likely way for it to fail is my co-founder and I get into a massive conflict <laughs> <laughs> and we don't see eye to eye and then it explodes that. I think that's the most likely way for Ultropia to fail in terms of traction and everything's been going really, really well. Um, and so I think it, it will keep going as long as my co-founder and I can continue to work together. <laughs> so don't tell, tell us the details, but how do you co-founder like work out the equity split? Mm, I... Well, I have 51% and he has 49%. Okay. Um, but everyone says never do 50 50. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of that's because I am the woman. And so by being a woman owned company, there's so many advantages. There's yeah. a lot of advantages. Many advantages yeah. Yes. And so we can apply. There's, it pops up on the SBIR grant. They're like, are you a woman owned company? Mm -hmm. When we want to um, get do a lot of uh, procurement agencies, a lot of universities, people who are buyers, they have diversity buyers and they'll go out and look and see, hey, um, are you woman owned? And that kind of jumps you up to the front of the line. Yeah, can you share your social media with us so people can reach out to you? Mm, yes. Um, and so we have um, just a website. It's like ultropia.us. And so you can go there. Um, and that's where our website is. Um, we also have a LinkedIn page, which is maybe Ultropia at LinkedIn. Um, I think those are the main places that we're on. Um, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, Amy Jean Swanson, you can always connect with me on LinkedIn. And so do you go by Amy or Amy Jean? I it's easier to find me if you put Amy Jean Swanson into social media. Mm -hmm. If you just put Amy Swanson in, you'll never find me. <laughs> okay. So is there is it so is your first name Amy Jean or is it Amy then middle name Jean? My middle name is Jean. Okay. But I, I, yeah. I actually know a couple of people that are like their first name. My name, first name is Amy Jean. Oh, yeah. It's I got I'll put it in there. I'll put Amy Jean in the stuff mm -hmm. just so people. I'll make sure that's on my handles just so people. Otherwise, Amy Swanson is a very common name. <laughs> yeah, very common. Yeah. yeah. Um can you give us any advice or wisdom, anything you want to talk about? Um, I think my, you can do it is my biggest <laughs> advice. Um, I just, I think entrepreneurship is so special. I think it's the heart of capitalism. I think it is the best way to have equity. If you actually want to see change in the world, if you actually want to see resources going different places, if you want to take the resources out of the hands of the few and distribute them to the masses, if you want to see women design stuff, if you want to see women like do different things and step out of just a domestic role into a different space and create a space that really is equitable 
equitable for different kinds of people, different races, different ages. Like there needs to be entrepreneurs of those different races and ages creating things for these populations. And so I think if you have an idea, if you want to pursue it, like, please do, it will make the world a better place and reach out to me, reach out to other resources and connect to some of this. You, you can do it. It's hard. It's harder if you're not maybe the traditional white, rich, successful male, but I think things are shifting. And the more that you're willing to, I think the world will be a better place. <laughs> so a while ago, somebody put on Twitter, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're gonna get you're gonna get punched in the face at least hundred times. People are like, by only a hundred, so you mean a million? <laughs> so like how do you person like take these punches in the face, you know, mm -hmm. being told all the time? Like, how do you like keep that from like like being a mentally draining on you? Mm -hmm. And I think um a lot of it is I I've been I, I think I can't deny my luck. Like it's I have been successful in this space. It was, it was hard cleaning houses. I did not have as much support. And I would say a lot of my early twenties were much more difficult. And then stepping into these spaces and like having done this, I've received so much support that I haven't gotten previously. And so it's made it so much easier to pursue. I think it's really, really easy to dwell on the negative people. I feel like a hundred people will say that they like you on the internet. And one person will say like you suck and that will stick out in your mind. And you'll want to go reply to this single person and just be like put all your energy into this single person well, sometimes you want to research okay you live in oakland california <laughs> i'm flying oakland california and knocking on your door you want to tell me this in person you know don't give your energy to the haters give it's it hard to, to though right <laughs> it's hard to they not to stick, they stick in your head and they you replay it and you replay it and you're like i just want to tell them this and i just want to tell them this instead of the hundred people who are like you were amazing you changed my life and like don't every time that you want to like respond to a hater respond to someone who has supported you like respond to, put all your energy into those positive people because you want that amplified you don't want the hate amplified yeah like remember right now i'm like sending like, like personal like, individual linkedin message on my linkedin connection i have like over twenty thousand right send an individual message right no but it's about the crowdfunding campaign though give them the gauge either like people know or say no or, or donate right like four have said i'm perfect before i said this i did not give you permission to link the message me on linkedin oh. i like right you do know we're first connections that does not matter i didn't give you permission like are you kidding me right now? Like, yeah, seriously, the, the, right? Why are you on LinkedIn? Yeah. The entire point of LinkedIn is for networking and connecting. I feel like I pretty much add everyone on LinkedIn. And if someone has something, you know, to reach out to me, I've mm -hmm. connected with amazing people on LinkedIn that I didn't know. And they were yeah. totally cold, like, hey, I just want to reach out to you and ask you this thing. And they've been amazing people. And so I leave my door open for opportunities. If you're not that way, why are you I on know. LinkedIn? <laughs> you just blew me right. I don't, yeah. I don't, yeah. Like, yeah. how am I going to permission for you? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> person if that was your mindset you couldn't exist on linkedin i feel like you get a million bot messages every single day like that person is probably freaking out over the bot messages like oh my goodness yeah, yeah. Right? They're just, and my <laughs> thing is why reply over the mess just, just ignore it right just ignore it yeah. yeah if i get too many bot spams i'll yeah. ignore it sometimes it's hard to tell with the bots these days they are very good i'm like oh this they have my same connections they have people i know and then i'm like oh woman well, this isn't maybe this, these are all bots and so yeah. <laughs> i know the reason i've been getting a lot is like you know uh, asian female really attractive, maybe like three or four connections. Her education is like some high school in, in China, yeah. but she's a president of a multi-billion dollar, you know, chemical country yeah. in Venezuela. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, this, a lot of them are bots. <laughs> yeah, it's just, you know, you see like blink through just on the cleanup stuff up. Yeah, up, up that would help, right? yeah. But it doesn't hurt me too much. And so it's No, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a favorite social media that you use? Oh, I, I go through different phases. I feel like I've never really been on Twitter. Um, I was a big Reddit fan. I do like Reddit fan. I think I messed up my Reddit algorithm and I'm not enjoying everything that I've seen on there. Yeah. So right now I'm on Instagram and I just really like, like the mat. And yeah. so I like new wave of media and the way they're presenting information. I just, I think it's so brilliant. It's so interactive. I think you can absorb a lot of content really, really easily. I feel like there's influencers who That's are like- education on TikTok. So much I, I follow education. I the from the University of Chicago on there talking about black holes and yes. phrases and stuff. Yes. It's, it's interesting stuff. And it's so absorbable. I feel like um, Reddit can get- uh, a little bit into a circle of yeah, people asking the same. Yeah, yeah. For a while, it was 
pretty good. And now I'm kind of like more the, the people generating content on TikTok and then on Instagram is just so excellent. And then the, the format of it is so brilliant and innovative. Um, and then you're just able, like, they're talking about like, Hey, if you want to produce this bottle, here are manufacturers who can do it. If you want to yeah. make a wallet, do this, follow this brand, like they, they lay it out for you. Anything that you want to do, people have a roadmap and you can go follow it. You haven't watched this on TikTok yet. Go to, it's called a hashtag Chicken Wars 2023. What, what is that? <laughs> it, it's like these chicken wars, right? It's like, it, 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 it's, it's insane, right? It's like hundreds of videos. The first video, this guy, he has a chicken walker before him, behind him. He says, hey, we're going to go, go in my pocket, about to go kick some ass, right? Other guy goes in there with this chick behind him, pull up, we're about to come get you, right? And all these videos, it's like, it's just insane, right? <laughs> Like people like they they like did like you know a chicken war versus the Avenger in game music, I mean it's like it's 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 very it's just hilarious right it's insane. Check this out. It, it is I need, I need it on these pockets of conversation. Oh. It's insane, yeah. Um, so is there anything else I should have asked you that I haven't? Anything else you want to talk about? Mm-hmm. I think as a founder, I feel like the lines are hard, and I feel like your projection between like this personal self that you want to be like, you want to be your authentic self all the time and finding the places of your authentic self and like your personal self and like um, where, where those lines are and then making sure that you're being effective in the things that you want to communicate with people and like how you want to communicate with them. And so finding like where, where those lines are and where your comfort is with people, I think is, is interesting. <laughs> I think that's a good point. Cause like, I think I'd be authentic self, but I suppose, you know, you're, you're raising funds, mm-hmm. you're doing research, and this one investment firm says, you know, like you sell a very traditional conservator, right? Yeah. Like, are you going to change your hair back to normal for yeah. this one VC? No. No, you're not, right? <laughs> it's not worth it, right? So I think yeah. I think a lot of people like, go, oh, you know, I got to, you know, be in a suit and tie with a hoodie, right? You know, mm-hmm. just be yourself, right? Just you be gotta, yourself. Because if you take the money from that company, you can't hide, your, hide yourself forever, right? Yeah. You have to be your true self. Yes. <laughs> Hey, Amy, this is a lot of fun. Thanks for doing this today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. It was a pleasure. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. Remember to be great every day. Be great every day.